guest today is Vincent Pelote, um, sometimes known as Vinny. Uh, he's been involved for 40 years in the work of preserving that most originally American of cultural endeavors, jazz recordings. Uh, he will provide today a description of the development of the Institute of Jazz Studies and the library, uh, which is part of Rutgers University, from its inception, including the library's treasures and rarities. And let me give you two minutes on, actually less than two minutes, on uh, Vincent's background. Uh, Vincent is the senior archivist and digital preservation strategist at the Institute of Jazz Studies and Library at Rutgers University, Newark, the largest jazz library in the world. He's compiled disc discographies on Billie Holiday, Lionel Hampton, and a discography on the Commodore Records label, which I can tell you has its own fascinating history. Mr. Pelota is one of the contributors to the Oxford Companion to Jazz. He's written a number of album program notes on Lee Connitz, Johnny Smith, Mary Lou Williams, Benny Carter, Curtis Fuller, and others. He has written book and sound recording reviews for the Association for Recorded Sound Collections Journal, uh, of which I understand he was president, and notes the quarterly journal of the Music Library Association. And he was one of the hosts of the radio program Jazz from the Archives, which aired on WBGO FM, 88.3 FM, uh, and National Public Radio during 1979 to 2014. Uh, so I have uh, great pleasure and indeed an honor to hand over the meeting to Vincent Pillot. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Paul. That was a pretty nice introduction. Uh, and, and that accent is perfect. I tell you, <laughs> it, it makes everything sounds great. You can read a phone book and it'd be great. Anyway. <laughs> I do that sometimes. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Um, listen, thank you all for inviting. So you're suggesting me. that as a program theme for one of our meetings there. Sure. Your home book. Why not? Why not? It sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for inviting me to do this. I I, I had hoped to have a video prepared uh, of the institute with a, like a little tour of the institute, but because of the uh, pandemic, and because of uh, my knee surgery. I was never able to really get that together. So I've got a sort of alternative program instead, which I hope is as entertaining uh, or, or informative, I should say. Uh, okay, with that out of the way, <laughs> I just want to say, uh, let me start out first of all with a, a little introductory video that uh, we were asked to do by, by the uh, administration at Rutgers. And um, all, all this really is, is a sort of an intro to the Institute of Jazz Studies and what we're sort of about. So I'm going to just share my screen and play this real quick so you can get an idea of what's happening. Uh, let me see. Okay, I think I got this right. I just have to pull up the library. And there it is. And there it is. And hopefully you're all seeing that. When I tell people that this is the largest jazz archives in the world, they're usually shocked. <laughs> they're usually surprised. I guess one reason is because it's located in, in an institution like Rutgers University. We have a very comprehensive jazz collection. You have scores, you have photographs, sound recordings, correspondence. These are ways in which you can get to know someone. This is a case that's full of the instruments of great jazz musicians. If you were to ask me to compare IJS with uh, another major archive, it would be Cooperstown because you have this fan base of, of scholars and people who, whether it's baseball or jazz, it's part of the tapestry of their life. We're listening right now to uh, the so-called Smith-Jones recordings from 1936 and you're actually hearing his first professional recording date on this horn. We have a lot of unique collections here uh, that you won't find anyplace else. We have the world's largest collection of jazz journals 
And these are journals from all over the world. So you don't have to go all over the world. You don't have to go to France to see a journal from France. We have it. The difference between having books on a subject and items that document that subject, it's, it's a very different experience to look at someone's handwriting. You know, they're writing about, you know, being on the road and, oh, I miss you, I miss home. You can see life through those people's eyes. So it's about making a connection with the artist. There are many things that are uniquely American, but few that have been such a major international cultural export. It is an important music. It's America's contribution to world culture. Food, water, sex, and jazz. I mean, it's just one of the essentials of this life. All right. <laughs> All right, that's our little introductory video that we did years ago. And it was, I don't know, remember exactly the year, but I do know that at that time, I was interim director of the Institute of Jazz Studies. Um, our longtime director, Dan Morgenstern, had retired, and um, I was put in charge temporarily uh, to keep things going. Uh, I'm no longer the interim director. We have a new director now. Uh, the young lady you saw speaking, uh, she was the associate director at the time. Her name was Adriana Curvo. She's, she is still there, but now she's head of archival collections and services, which includes the Institute, but also the Dana Library Archive as well. So she kind of got a promotion while well, I got a demotion. <laughs> so, how could I say? That's the way they, they, they love you there at Rutgers. They give you the old are you screw, as they call it. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, the uh, gentleman with the final last words, food, sex, and what did he say? Food, sex, and, and something, jazz, the essentials. Uh, that was Tad Hirschhorn. He was um, the other longtime resident of the Institute of Jazz Studies. He was an archivist there uh, for many, many years, and he retired uh, a few years ago and is happily living in uh, Newark at the moment, but he's moving to North Carolina. Uh, he's also quite an, quite an expert in the music, and um, he wrote a book on um, jazz impresario Norman Granz, which if you uh, get a chance to see it or find it or, you know, whatever, pick it up. It's a great book. It uh, tells you all about jazz at the Philharmonic and all the other things that Norman Granz was involved in, including his labels, uh, Clef, Norgran, and Verve. And Pablo, these are all his labels, and uh, he was quite a mover and shaker in jazz, as well as in other areas as well. Uh, he kind of used jazz as a way of, of, of uh, promoting civil rights in a lot of ways. He was a very interesting man, Mr. Norman Granz was, uh, for those of you who may not know much about him. Uh, anyway, um, so that's uh, the little video. Um, the only thing I didn't do is, is tell you the current people who were there at the moment. Um, besides Adriana and myself, uh, Elizabeth Searles is one of our archivists, very lovely young lady who came to us from uh, the archive, uh, Sousa Archive. And, um, but she's a jazz person. She, she used to work for the Star Jeanette Foundation. Uh, those are very early jazz labels. Uh, King Oliver, Big Spider Beck, all recorded for Jeanette and some others. And um, Diana Biono is also our metadata archivist. So that's our current uh, <laughs> uh, cast of characters, basically. Um, we hope to add more as the pandemic uh, lessens at the Institute. And unfortunately, right now, uh, nobody is allowed into the Institute of Jazz Studies unless you are a Rutgers University student, faculty, or staff. So no outside researchers are allowed in at the moment, which is, again, unfortunate because you really need to get there and look around and, and, and you know, just see what's there to really get a full, you know, the full uh, magilla, I guess, of what the Institute's all about. But I'm going to try to give you some of that with the, a PowerPoint presentation. So. Once again, let me share screen here. I think I got this right. And uh, let me pull this thing up. Can you all see that? Uh, slideshow. It looks good. OK, there it is. Ta-da, Institute of Jazz Studies, photo montage, as it's called. OK, the first uh, uh, slide. Uh, Sheldon Harris is the curator and Marshall Stearns, these, these two gentlemen very important to the Institute of Jazz Studies. Marshall Stearns, this gentleman here with the glasses, 
He was the founder of the Institute of Jazz Studies. He founded it in 1952. Marshall Stearns' idea was um, he saw jazz. Uh, first of all, he was a, a professor of English. He was a Chaucer scholar at Hunter College, but he was also a jazz fan and one of the few people who realized that jazz was not just a dance music, but it was also artistic, artistic music, a very important artistic music. And so to him, it was very important that there be a place where people could come and study the music. And so therefore, uh, he, instead of going to a university or a college, uh, he just created this place in his base, in his basement, in his apartment <laughs> in Greenwich Village. And this is actually what his apartment in Greenwich Village looked like. You would go there and you would see all these recordings on, on, on shelves. And he had all sorts of instruments. You can see some of them in the background there. And uh, he had old books, he had journals, and all this was sitting in his apartment. So at some point he decided that, uh, well, as nice as this is, he's not gonna be around forever. It'd be nice if somebody would take this on, like a college or university. And so he offered it to a number of different places and eventually Rutgers University, uh, Newark campus is the, is the place that actually uh, ended up getting it. Now Rutgers has several campuses, of course. The, the main one is in New Brunswick. There's another one in Camden. And of course, Newark is the, uh, the second largest campus after New Brunswick. And the reason why Newark was chosen was because of its location. I mean, it has an airport, Pennsylvania station is there. so. Easy, it's easy to get to. It was much better to have it in Newark as opposed to New Brunswick, which is a little harder to get to or Camden. And so uh, it's a good thing that it came to Newark at the time. And it came there in the year 1966. Uh, Marshall Stearns unfortunately had a heart attack and died probably before Rutgers was ready for the, the, the entire thing to show up. But it did come there and it was placed in the basement of, of what was called Dana Library, it's still called Dana Library, I don't know why I said that. And, and uh, it was in that basement for a number of years. It was then moved to another building off, slightly off campus called Bradley Hall where it resided for a number of years. And then in 1994, it was sent back to Dana Library on a fourth floor, uh, a, a spacious f facility was built to accommodate it. And it's been sitting on the fourth floor of Dana Library since 1994, which is where it resides to this day. Okay, the very first director of the Institute of Jazz Studies, uh, full-time executive director was this gentleman named Christopher White. He was the uh, bass player with Dizzy Gillespie's orchestra and Dizzy Gillespie's small group, I should say, and also uh, Nina Simone and others. He was also an educator, and he was actually on the faculty of the music department at Rutgers University at the time in Newark. And uh, they asked him if he would uh, be the executive director of the Institute of Jazz Studies, and he agreed. And so his, he was there from 72 to about 75. Um, of course, the next director after him was Dan Morgenstern. Some of you may know him. Uh, he's been, he's, he's still alive, by the way. He's 92, he'll be 92 years old <laughs> next month. And uh, he was the editor of Downbeat Magazine for a number of years, as well as a few other magazines. And um, he was uh, a very well-known uh, figure in jazz, as far as you know, a historian is concerned, a critic of the music. And um, having him as director was really a godsend because he had a lot of connections to the jazz world. Um, we were able to build our collections mostly because of his reputation and his stewardship. And he really did help get the Institute uh, or make the Institute the premier archive in the world. Uh, and, and really he was a wonderful boss to work for and, and so knowledgeable. I mean, <laughs> I learned something from him almost every day as far as the jazz world was concerned and, and, and jazz. And um, he's written a couple of books. And um, if you can get his, um, his latest book, which all right now the title kind of escapes me, I think it's A Life in Jazz or something like that, which is a collection of his liner notes. He used to write all these wonderful, wonderful album liner notes. And um, they weren't just, you know, just things to put on the back of an album. I mean, they, a lot of them were really very informative and, and told you things that you could never find any place else. So it's a good thing that he did 
uh, write that book. And um, he did retire in, in 2012 after being there for well, a good long time. Uh, this gentleman uh, is Ed Berger. He was the associate director of the Institute of Jazz Studies. Uh, originally, he started out as the person that kept the Institute of Jazz Studies open uh, after Chris White retired, because you can see the date, 1976. Chris left in 75. So what happened was uh, they asked Ed Berger uh, if he would uh, keep the Institute open for a couple of days during the you know, week until they could find a director to take over for Chris White. And so Ed agreed to do this, and then eventually he became uh, associate director, and he was our associate director until 2011 when he retired. Uh, he came back again as special projects uh, a person, but then um, unfortunately uh, he passed away in 2016 uh, of a heart attack. Um, Ed Berger, if you don't know the name, uh, was also the author of several wonderful jazz books, including the uh, discography uh, of Benny Carter. His father, Mauro Berger, wrote the uh, definitive biography of Benny Carter, and Ed did the uh, discography. They're both huge books, actually. If you see them, they're, they're both gigantic books. And, um, of course, Benny lived longer than I think anybody thought he would. He lived into his 90s as well. And so after uh, Ed's father passed away, after the, the book was published, Ed did a revision of the book and brought it up to date after uh, his father passed away. And, and Benny Carter and the Institute of Jazz Studies had a, has, had, has had a wonderful connection. We have a lot of his uh, recordings. We have, of course, some of his uh, um, arrangements. Uh, we have some of his instruments. We have his, his alto sax. We have his C melody sax. We have his trumpet. Um, he also uh, started something called the Burger Carter uh, fund, which is now called the Burger Carter Burger Fund, uh, in, in honor of Ed Burger. Uh, the first burger was Moro Burger. And uh, what it does is it uh, allows us to give $1,000 grants out to people who want to come to the Institute and do research. And uh, we still do that to this day. Uh, Ed, Ed, Ed and, between Ed and Dan, I mean, they were a wonderful team. I guess you could throw me in there as the third wheel. So we used to call ourselves the ancient jazz trio as opposed to the modern jazz quartet. And uh, we were there together for, uh, you know, close to, well, over 30 years, three of us. And then, of course, people started retiring. And I'm, I guess I'm the last man standing. <laughs> you know, so uh, I don't know how long I'll be around, but we'll just have to see how it goes. Uh, and there I am, <laughs> in a very unflattering photo, uh, but I thought I'd throw this in there. Uh, I was interim director from 2012 to 2015, which was quite a dream for me because um, I started out at the Institute of Jazz Studies in 1970, probably 75, uh, 74, probably 74. I started out there as a work-study student. Um, I knew the Institute of Jazz Studies was at Rutgers. I applied to Rutgers as a student in 1972, not just because of the Institute, but because I, I was I was going to be a music major, a music teacher. And uh, I knew the Institute was there. So I went down to the basement and um, I got acquainted with the place. And I knew at some point I would probably end up working there. And I did <laughs> as a work study student. Uh, I um, graduated in 76 or 77, actually. And um, I was perfectly content to be a music teacher, but uh, the Institute of Jazz Studies had a librarian named Marie Griffin who applied to the National Endowment for the Humanities to get a grant to catalog sound recordings on a national database. And they needed somebody to come in and help with the cataloging who knew something about jazz. So I was given a call by Ed Berger and asked if I would take the the, uh, the grant for two years and do it and do that that job, and so I said, "Sure, I'll do it." So I took the I took the job, thinking I would only be there for two years. But as you can see, uh, that two years became forty plus. <laughs> so they kept finding things for me to do. And they kept moving me around from one thing to the other, and eventually I had to get my library degree, which I did in '85. And uh, I became a librarian, and I've been a librarian ever since, and I'm still a librarian. And uh, I'm very happy to say that the Institute of Jazz Studies has been my home, my second home, 
I, and I and and it's it's you could have asked for a better job for somebody who loves jazz who at one time thought he might be a musician jazz musician but um i like to eat <laughs> so instead of uh being a musician where that's not always the case uh i i went and got my degrees and uh i'm working every day and getting a nice salary but and i'm very much involved in jazz and and all of its many aspects uh except maybe for performing but you don't want to hear me play anyway there are much better guitar players out there than i am anyway <laughs> this is our current director uh wayne winborn he was hired in 2015 and he is a very interesting man. Uh, he comes to us from a number of um, um, oh, uh, nonprofit uh, type situations. And uh, his main job really is to raise funds to keep the Institute afloat and uh, also to, to steward the Institute uh, under his own vision. And um, he has so far been, been a wonderful director to work for. And he is responsible for us getting the uh, Count Basie collection, which we have now housed at the Institute of Jazz Studies. And, um, you know, he's, he's uh, very knowledgeable about the music. And he's just uh, a, a gregarious, a gregarious and uh, funny. And I'm sure. OK, that's interesting. And uh, so, so if you ever come to the Institute of Jazz Studies, you have to meet this guy. He's, he, he'll, he'll charm the pants off you, and he'll probably get you to donate some money to the Institute as well. Uh, he's just a very uh, you know, interesting man, and, and, and I'm very glad to have Wayne Winborn as our executive director. And we've been very lucky in that respect. All of our directors have been fantastic, really. Uh, and he continues that tradition. Um, just to give you an idea of what the Institute looks like, here's a, a photo of our book stacks. We have, oh God, I don't even know how many now. It's been so, so many years that we've added to this collection since we got it from Marshall Stearns. But we have thousands of books on jazz um, and, and jazz related uh, uh, topics as well. And this is just a small area of, of, of where our books are sitting. Um, this is one of our listening booths. Um, we, we, unlike places like the Library of Congress, uh, if you go to places like that, they put you in a little room and then somebody takes a recording down in another room and they give you headphones and they play the record, and, but you never get to touch the record or see the record really. Well, we're not like that at the Institute of Jazz Studies. We actually give you the album or the CD or the tape and we set you up in a room and you can actually put the record on yourself, listen to it as many times as you want. Uh, we're very friendly that way. <laughs> and you can listen to all different formats. You can listen to LPs, you can listen to cassettes, you can listen to open reel tape as we have in the background there. There's that open reel machine sitting there. Um, and, and I know you're all familiar with these formats. I don't have to explain any of them to you. And uh, that's one of the things that I, I'm very happy about that we're so, fr that we're so open and friendly. Uh, to, to people who want to come in and use the Institute. And we don't have that sort of stuffiness that a lot of the other institutions that's similar to ours might have. Uh, this is our photo collection. We have um, a whole bunch of uh, photo files. Uh, and um, as you can see on top, there's a photo of Max Roach, which got solidly cut off. But, but uh, you know, you name the artist, you name the, the person involved in jazz, and we probably have a photo, at least a photo of that person. And um, uh, we also, uh, which I didn't do, I guess I didn't take a picture of the other files that we have. We also have uh, clippings files. And what these files are, are they're, they're um, files of magazine and newspaper articles on jazz we've that we've accumulated over the years and since jazz is so badly indexed uh, in terms of library terms um you can just go to these files and let's say you want to see something on jack t garden we have a file on jack t garden and you open that file and you see articles you'll see newspaper clippings you'll see posters you'll see all sorts of things in that file that will get you started on you know your way to learning more about Jack T. Garden, and then from there you can go to the books and the journals and that sort of thing. But the but the clippings files is a very important part of our collection, and um, that's the one of the first things we will probably you know send you to if you came in doing research on particular artists. 
Uh, these are our stacks. Uh, you saw a little bit of that in the other, f uh, the little film that I showed. Uh, and this is an area of the Institute that is, has its own temperature and humidity control. And it's done that way because we have so many different formats back there. Besides CDs, we have, of course, 78 RPM recordings. We also have um, LPs. We have tapes, open reel tapes, cassette tapes. Um, and um, we have videos. We have film. Um, overall, we have probably uh, over 100,000 recordings back there. And, um, and these are recordings that we've accumulated over the years. Of course, in the, in the original Marshall Stearns collection, that came with a bunch of LPs and, and, and um, 78s. And, and we've since added to that over the years. And um, we're continuing to do that as time goes on. Uh, we were lucky in that um, a lot of record companies were just sending us stuff automatically. We didn't even have to ask them for it. They were just sending it to us because they knew we existed. They knew they knew that the stuff would be kept, you know, in a nice area like this. And and so they were just sending us stuff routinely, like they would like they would send to a radio station. And um, that's not happening so much now because you don't get a lot of promo copies of things anymore. But but you know, we have a budget. I'm able to buy stuff and I do occasionally do get companies to send me things. So it's still going on. Um, Okay, this is the other thing that we're very much known for, and that's our archival collection. This is the Mary Lou Williams collection, which is probably one of our largest collections and also one of our most used collections. Uh, for those of you who may not know who Mary Lou Williams is, and I'm sure most of you do know, she was uh, for a, a long time pianist and arranger for the Andy Kirk Orchestra during the 1930s and 40s. She also arranged for uh, Duke Ellington and Jimmy Lunsford and others. Uh, she was also very much involved in the whole bebop movement in that she was um, uh, sort of a sort of mother figure, a teacher to people like Dizzy Gillespie and, and, and uh, Delonious Monk. They would go to her apartment and, and ask her questions about music and, and harmony and arranging and that sort of thing. And she would sit down and she would talk to them and she would, and she would help them out with this stuff. And, and she herself, besides being a great piano player, uh, was also a wonderful uh, composer. And um, she eventually got into the whole sacred music thing and did a number of uh, a sacred uh, you know, concerts. And, 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 and composed a bunch of religious music, um, Mary Lou's Mass, et cetera, et cetera. And um, her collection was given to us by Father Peter O'Brien, who is the executive director of the Mary Lou Wiggins Foundation. And uh, he gave it to us strictly on the, on the reputation of Dan Morgenstern and the Institute of Jazz Studies, and because he knew we would take good care of it. And as you can see, they're sitting, they're, there's some of it sitting there in, in, in these uh, wonderful archival boxes. There's finding aids online if you want to know what's actually in some of this stuff. And, um, and let me see, what else can I say? And besides the Mary Lou Williams collection, we also have the James P. Johnson collection. And we have a bunch of other collections as well. Uh, Manny Album. Uh, I mean, I can just run through the list. I already said we had the Count Basie collection. And so uh, this is one of the things that we do. Uh, somebody raised their hand. Um, is there a question? Probably just somebody wanting to be the first at the end of yeah, your talk. Yeah, oh, 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 oh. yeah oh, okay. we'll take questions later. OK, great, great, great. Okay, uh, c continuing, this is also another wonderful part of our, our archival collection. We have a lot of this wonderful music. Uh, this is, uh, these are transcriptions that were done by Andrew White of Charlie Parker solos. Uh, and and it's, it's amazing that somebody would actually sit down and, and do that. But uh, this is what he did. We also happen to have the, uh, if you're familiar with the Parker with strings collection or uh, music that came out on, Ver on Verve Records. Um, uh, and, well, before Verve on, on, I guess, Mercury. And um, we have those arrangements as well. And we have, of course, like I said, a lot of Benny Carter arrangements. Uh, and, and we have, you know, arrangements by other uh, people as well. And we take care of all this stuff. We put them in these wonderful boxes. We also have a wonderful um, uh, biography, uh, partial biography, 
uh, autobiography, I should say, that was written by Arm Louis Armstrong in his own handwriting, which is very interesting as well. And that's sitting in that same you know area with, with the uh, other archival materials. And so the archival stuff is very important. And um, if you go to our website, you'll see a collection, you'll see all the archival collections listed. Um, and I don't have the URL for our website. You'll have to just go to Google and put in Institute of Jazz Studies and it'll take you right to it. So there you go. And here's the rear items uh, instrument cabinet. Now you saw a little bit of this uh, on the film when Tad Hirshhorn pulled out the Lester Young saxophone. And, and yes, that was the saxophone Lester Young used when he was at the Count Basie Orchestra. I'm very happy to have that. I'm very proud to have that. We also have Benny, uh, uh, Ben Webster's tenor saxophone. We also have Don Bias's tenor saxophone. But we also have a lot of trumpets. And the one that, that Adriana is holding right now in her hand, that's a Miles Davis trumpet. And as you can see, his, you can see his, his name on it, <laughs> Miles Davis there. And, um, and it's, it's a weird color. Uh, the, the Martin Company was the one that made this for him. It's also in the key of C, which is weird because most trumpets are in the key of B flat. But um, anyway, it's a C trumpet. And um, I don't know if Miles ever really used it, but um, yeah, there it is. And it's, it's very colorful and it's something that we use in exhibits a lot. And people, you know, love to see it because it just, it's so eye-catching, really. Uh, there's also other instruments in that cabinet, that clarinet that you see over there on the bottom. That probably is the Pee Wee Russell clarinet. We also have one by Clarence Hutchin Ryder. And um, we have a bunch of other, sac uh, other t uh, trumpets by Roy Eldridge, uh, Pee Wee Irwin. Uh, excuse my phone ringing in the background. I can't do anything about that. My wife should be getting it soon, I hope. And uh, so that's the rear items room. There's all sorts of rare things back there besides um, instruments. We also have Grammy Awards. We have um, le you know letters uh, written by very famous people. We have inst we have uh, a lot of uh, early phonographs back there, uh, table model, uh, Victrolas. And um, you have a drum set that belonged to Tommy Benford, who was one of the last of the uh, General Morton Red Hot Peppers people. Uh, so it's a wonderful place to see. I mean, if you, if you ever do get a chance to come out and we're, and we're allowing people to come in, you know, I, I'll give you the full tour. You'll get to see all these things. And, and it's just so much nicer to actually be there and, and experience it up close and personal. But I hope this gives you a little taste of what it's about. Um, we also do a number of programs at the Institute. We, we do these monthly research roundtables, is what we call them. And um, as you can see, I'm sitting there with my Mets shirt, <laughs> proudly, <laughs> uh, with uh, Gretchen Monker III. And if that name doesn't mean anything to you, maybe his father's name means something to you, Gretchen Monker. He was a very famous bass player uh, who played with Billie Holiday and, and others. But Gretchen Monker III, who's sitting there, is a Newark uh, native and, and Newark resident, and one of the early sort of avant-garde trombone players in jazz. Uh, he also uh, did a lot of recording for Blue Note Records. And, um, you know, yeah, I call him avant-garde, but to be honest with you, he's not as avant-garde as some of these other avant-garde players are. I mean, he's not that out in space. I mean, he, he, he's, he's somebody you can listen to and follow. What, what he's doing. And he started out basically being, a, you know, just a, a sort of a bop influenced trombonist. And he played with some wonderful people like Benny Gulson, Art Farmer. And um, he's just a, a wonderful, com oh, he's also a wonderful composer besides a wonderful musician. And um, he comes to the Institute once in a while and just likes to hang out and talk and stuff. So, so we decided we would do a round table on him. And this, and this is, uh, you know, one of the visuals from that round table. I was a lot younger then. <laughs> Whatever. But I, I didn't have much, much gray hair either. I like that. Anyway, let's move on. Um, Clement's Place. That is our nightclub. Yes, we have a nightclub, folks. Um, what happened, uh, uh, I don't remember the exact year, but um, there was a professor of history at Rutgers named uh, Clement Price, a uh, very well-known jazz, uh, not jazz, but he's a well-known Newark uh, historian. 
uh, he knew he knew all about Newark. I mean, he, he would give these wonderful tours of Newark and tell you all about the history and and so on and so forth. Uh, he was he was also um, one uh, on one of the um, commissions that Obama, President Obama, had founded, and um, it was quite a you know wonderful figure uh and and somebody who we hoped would be with us for a long time but unfortunately he 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 died uh, unexpectedly and um what we did was uh the um, administration uh had some space that they decided to turn into a nightclub because clement was a very big fan of jazz he was a big fan of the answer to jazz studies and we decided to give uh, clement pr pr price uh, uh, we, we used his name uh, as uh, to give to this nightclub. And, and what we've been doing for the last, oh God, how many years now? Uh, two or three years, I guess. We've been bringing in all these wonderful acts to, to, to perform there. And it's, it's been a wonderful place for people to come and listen to jazz and have a drink, have something to eat, and just enjoy the music, enjoy the camaraderie. And it's all for free. Nobody gets charged anything. And it's just a wonderful situation, which unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we had to stop. But here's just a small sample of the kind of thing that's going on here. Yeah. young lady is Alexis Morast. She is a kid. <laughs> I mean, she's, I don't even know if she's 16 at this point. I mean, she's, she's very young, but she's got such a presence and such, such talent for somebody so young to be able to stand there and do that. And, 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 and just, she's amazing. I mean, that's all I can say. She's, she's, she's one of the future, stars of this music well she's a star right now i mean imagine what she's going to be you know as she gets older and and gets a little more seasoned and that sort of thing but um she's been at clements several times and she's always brings the house down and um you know so we feature young talent like this we brought in some more established people as well and um once this pandemic lets up and we're able to bring people back into Clements. I hope maybe some of you can come down and check it out. The concerts usually take place on Fridays and Saturdays, uh, occasionally a Sunday, but usually it's Fridays and Saturdays. Um, usually starts around seven o'clock or so, and uh, usually two sets. And like I said, drinks, food, all free. Just come down, check it out. It's a wonderful place to hang out and just listen to the music. And folks, I think... And folks, like I said, that's pretty much it. That's all, folks. All right. I'll stop sharing now. We'll get back to this. Great. Okay. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, so now we have some questions. So okay. we'll, start, we'll start with Bill Till. All right. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Vince. So, uh, you're you're a lovely guy. I mean, you know, you, you're just happy, you know. I'm, and I'm happy to hear you. And oh, well, I'm delighted you. to learn of the uh, uh, Jazz Institute. Uh, at first, a, a technical question: sure. What the hell is discography? Oh, okay. Uh, you heard of bibliographies, right? Yes. All right. A discography basically is a, is a um, sort of a bibliography of recordings. 
uh, it's it's a it's a way to find records. Um, okay. The, yeah, the very first one was uh, was done by a gentleman from France named Charles Delaunay, and it's a small book from 1934, I think. And it, and of course, there wasn't a lot of jazz at that point, so you could have a small book like that, and it just tells you the sessions. It tells you who's on the recordings because think about it, 78s very small label you can't get all the information on a 78 usually all you get is the title and the name of the band so you don't know who's in the band you don't know what year it was recorded you don't know where it was recorded and so 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 charles delaunay decided i'm going to make this book where i'm going to have all this information listed so people who buy 78s will know who's on the record when it was recorded mm -hmm. so, and, so. and that's what a discography is okay so okay. so here's my real question okay um in something like jazz where um well it's going on 100 years of, you know, of music mm -hmm. um how do you do research um uh, from uh, the past when nobody's still living that went through it i mean that's that's a good question uh well that's sort of why we're there i mean that's we're, we're at the place to come to for that. Um, now, we're not the only place. There are other archives. I mean, there's one in New Orleans, the, the Tulane University, the, the Hogan Archive. Uh, there's there's another one out in, in Kansas City, uh, University of Missouri in Kansas City, uh, the, the, the Mar Sound Archive. Uh, there's New York Public Library. They have they have a Roger and Hammerstein collection, a Library mm -hmm. of Congress. So these, these places all have stuff that you can go to to uh, find out this information, um, it's 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 not easy sometimes. I mean, you really do have to do a lot of detective work, and mm -hmm. um, but those who are interested in doing this kind of work do it all the time, and um, and we're there to help. We're there to steer you in the right direction, and that's that's my job as as one of the reference librarians to steer you in the right direction. So just come to well, me. Thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> Next question. John Tomaszewski. Yeah, hi, Vincent. Great talk. Enjoyed it. Didn't know there were such resources available. Uh, but I, I guess my question is uh, a kind of a double fold. Uh, <laughs> one is, do you find very many young people getting into jazz, number one? And number two, are there courses at the university that uh, are uh, dedicated to jazz? Well, one of our goals is to get more young people involved because that's the future. I mean, we have to get have to get the youngins in there, you know, really. Um, unfortunately, uh, jazz has a sort of, sort of a low profile. Um, you don't see it on television anymore. And, and it was a time which you could see it on TV, but you don't. Uh, at one time, jazz was the popular music of this country. I mean, during the 1930s and 40s, you could turn on radio, you could hear Count Basie, you hear Duke Ellington, you could hear all these bands. We also got to hear Sammy Kay and Kay Kaiser, but that's another story. <laughs> but you also got to hear a lot of, you know, good jazz as well. And uh, but but all that went away. And, and um, there aren't that many radio stations that really play jazz. I mean, in the New York metropolitan area, you have this WBGO, 88.3 you know, on the FM dial, mm -hmm. and occasionally 89.9 WKCR uh, out of Columbia University. And of course, we just, if, for those of you that didn't know that, we just lost Phil Schapp, who was a very well-known jazz uh, figure, uh, WKCR and Columbia University for many years. So yeah, it's, it's it, getting young people involved is, is, is one of our goals and one, and one of the things we try to do. I think one of the ways we can probably hook them is to, is to show the connection between jazz and hip hop and rap uh, music because there is a connection. Uh, as as uh, weird as it may sound, <laughs> a lot of those artists do use jazz records to sample in their music. And, and you know, that's, that's one way we can sort of hook them in. Um, but um, as far as courses are concerned, the answer to jazz studies doesn't really have any courses, but we support the master's in jazz program that's at Rutgers Newark. Uh, you can actually get a master's degree in jazz history there if you want to do that. And uh, of course, New Brunswick has the actual jazz performance program. And that's where you can go to actually learn how to play your instrument and study with some of the great you know, jazz musicians like Conrad Hurley who plays trombone and and uh, you know people like that. So, so yeah, there are courses, but but most of the uh, the performance stuff is in New Brunswick. But we do have the master's 
program in, 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 in Newark. Thank you. No problem. Hello. Hello. Yes. I, have, I have a question. Mm -hmm. who's, who's that? Can you hear me? Yes, but who who's speaking? Uh, Henry Wallhauser, Hank Wallhauser. Oh, 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 okay, Hank, go ahead. He's just dialed in. He probably can't see us either, but oh. go ahead. Okay. Uh, he's a, he's a I, musician, uh, by the way. He's a pianist, a fine oh, pianist. Great. Uh, good laugh. Uh, a few years ago, I think I did ask Stan Morgenstern about collecting, about accepting collections of of uh, well, really vintage jazz stuff. I think at the time they weren't accepting collections, uh, which of course you have so much mm. that it's probably uh, they would just duplicate a lot of what you have. But and I also have some uh, jazz piano <laughs> books uh, of uh, the great pianists Earl Hines, uh, uh, Earl Garner. Uh, Teddy Wilson and so forth. Uh, now, do you accept any of that stuff now? Um, we're we're. Tr eh, it's a good question. Um, part of the problem right now is uh, because we're kind of shut down because of this pandemic thing. Um, we're not really accepting much of anything like that. Um, it, it would be nice to have an inventory of of what you have so that we can see if we don't already have it. Um, you know, keep in mind, we've been collecting stuff like this for a long time. So, so it's a good chance that we might have some of those things that you're offering. And we would like to, so instead of just getting it and just, you know, having to throw it away ourselves, it would be nice to, to, to just take things that we don't have. Yeah. Uh, and, and so if you have an inventory and you can send me maybe a, a, an email with some of the titles or, 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 or a list of titles that you have, I can check it against our inventory. And and we can you know maybe talk talk turkey yeah. at that point. Um, okay, I but can that's do the that. best I can really offer. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Henry. So DDA Peron. Oh yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much. This is a very interesting lecture. I really enjoyed that. Um, like many, uh, I was very saddened last week to hear about Phil Sharp. You just yeah. mentioned it, but I was wondering if you knew him, if you had a story about him. That, uh, <laughs> but if I may, I have a, I have a other questions. Um, uh, I noticed in your uh, photographs that uh, your archival system is by record label, and um, so uh, how do you find out? Say, say you want um, something by Art Farmer. You mentioned Art Farmer, uh, and I don't know if it's a uh, uh, BMG or Sony. Or, um, you know, living records, whatever it is. How do you find um, that particular um, disc? And if I may, the last one, what about streaming? Uh, do you archive uh, digital music? Okay, boy, that's a lot of stuff. All right, about, Sorry, about uh, that's okay. Uh, about I'm going to get the microphone, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I really enjoyed your lecture. Thank oh, you so much. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you, really. Uh, about the Phil Schapp, uh, I've known Phil Schapp for, oh God, I don't even know how many years. Uh, I, I There goes my dog. We you Max, stop it. Um, I first heard, of course, him on the radio. Uh, I was a student and um, he, he, he would love to tell the story, but I, I used to tell him the story how I, I had this horrible toothache and I wouldn't go to the dentist because he was doing this Fletcher Henderson festival and playing all this wonderful Fletcher Henderson music. And I didn't want to miss any of it. So I, I prolonged going to the dentist and <laughs> suffered with this tooth thing because I wanted to hear more Fletcher Henderson. <laughs> and he thought that was so great that I was so dedicated to jazz that I would <laughs> rather be in pain than, than leave him and, and not listen to his music. And um, he actually worked for us briefly in, in the 80s, we had a, um, a, a jazz oral history project where we were interviewing a lot of the older swing jazz musicians. And we had all this, you know, material. And so we brought him in as sort of co-coordinator, associate coordinator. So he actually worked at the Institute for a, a brief minute, a, a, about amount of time. And he was such a joy to have around because he's so yeah. knowledgeable and so, and, and, and it was really because of him that I got to meet some of these great 
musicians like Sonny Greer. I met Sonny Greer. I met uh, Snub Mosley. I met I met uh, Sam Wooding. I met all these old jazz guys because Phil had all these great connections to these guys. Uh, so that's the Phil Schaap thing, and I was really really broken up when he when he passed because he yeah. I had just spoken to him maybe a month before that, and and he didn't sound like very hopeful that things were going to get any better. So I wasn't surprised, but you just hate to, you just hate to, you know, see someone like that. And he was only 70 years old. I mean, geez, I mean, oh. come on. That's, that's hmm. nothing, man. But anyway, um, as far as finding recordings, we, we have our recordings set up by label and issue number. And we did that for a reason because of discographies, which I spoke about earlier. If you go to a discography, it will, it will give you the issue number and the label for any session that you want. So you, you, you look it up and you say, I want this Blue Note album, Blue Note 15, 19 or whatever. We go to the back room, we go to our Blue Note section, we pull out 15, 19, we bring you the album. That's how we do it. We also have an online catalog. So you can go into the online catalog on, at Rucker's website. You call up the name. You call up whatever. It pops up. We have a number. We have a, we have a label and an issue number. We go in the back. We find it. We bring it out to you. That's how we find things at the Institute of Jazz Studies. Okay. Um, your last question was about uh, the streaming. storage. Streaming. Um, we don't do the streaming thing. Uh, uh, there are... Um, Naxos and Alexander Street Press both have streaming jazz, but we don't really subscribe to either one of those services because we have the records. Uh, we try to we try to have the actual recordings there because uh, if those services ever go down, if something ever happens to them, you lose your you lose your music. Whereas we always have the music because we own it; it's ours. It's sitting in the back. Um, uh, I think the library does subscribe to Naxos streaming music, but not the jazz stuff so much. And a lot of that stuff isn't on Naxos, so you can't even get it. Even if you have Naxos as a streaming service, it doesn't carry all the jazz material anyway, so you're not getting it all anyhow. So uh, that's, uh, I guess that answers your question, but we're, 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 we're going to hope that in the future we can do some type of streaming thing so that we can... Uh, like, like for instance, that 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 little clip I jo I showed you of that singer, we would, would love to be able to stream stuff from Clement's place so that people don't have to come to Clement's per se. They can just sit down and tune into it, and we can just do the performance and and have it go out that way. But there's all sorts of legal things involved. So once once you start doing that, you got to start signing contracts and making sure everybody's happy and nobody's being ripped off and that kind of thing. So so yeah, it, it's it's something we have to work out for the future, but we will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, two, two quick follow-ups to a couple of those points. Uh, one is, um, do, do you have uh, your, you said you have uh, catalog information online, people can sit there and look for things. Is that also online through the internet so that people could, could do some pre-searching before they come to know that you, you have things they might want? Yes. Uh, yes. That's, I, that, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you can do it. You know, I, don't, I don't think you have to be a Rutgers student to get into the catalog. I think you can actually just go to the website and search yeah. it and pull it up. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the other the other point is uh, about streaming. Um, my impression is that CDs are almost a thing of the past and that that new new music is being issued online through streaming. So so one way or another, I guess you're going to have to come to grips with that. Yes, we are. Uh, and in fact, that's that's something that the music world, in fact, the music library world is going to have to come into uh, 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 grips with because, um, you know, what do you do with that? I mean, you have a website, for instance, where, where, where that's the only way to get to that music. You know, what happens if that website goes down? I mean, how do, how do you archive that? I mean, how do you catalog that? I mean, it's see, these are all things that we're going to have to eventually yeah. get into. Uh, but until that happens... We'll we'll do the CDs. I mean, yeah. it, I'm glad people are still doing CDs. In fact, uh, Blue Note is issuing uh, right now a, a, a wonderful set of, of of Lee Morgan at the Lighthouse recordings that were never heard before, and they're coming out in both LP and CD. And uh, so we're going to try to get both sets because as an archive, we have to have both formats. So we still collect LPs. We still collect CDs. We still collect 78s. We mm -hmm. collect all these different formats because that's because what our archive is. 
vinyl 33s are coming back. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. It's amazing. I never thought I'd see that happen, but it, they are coming yeah. back. Yeah. Yes. And they're durable. I mean, be, yeah. LPs have lasted a long time, and they will last as long as you don't play them. <laughs> the problem with an LP is when you play it, you're basically destroying it. Every time yeah. you play it, you're destroying yeah. it a little a bit yeah. at a time. But if you don't play it, it'll last forever. Yeah. <laughs> 78s also. 78s are still around. And we have some 78s that go way back, way back. And yeah. still, they still play. Well, I got tons of follow-up questions, but let me uh, let me hand that microphone at this moment to Dick Griggs because he had his hand up. It went down, but I know he has a question. He told me yesterday. Dick. Okay. Um, Vincent, it is Dick Griggs, and it's really good to see you again after all these years. The last yes. time we were together was in the American Jazz Hall of Fame uh, there you go. program. Uh, and my question has really been asked in a different way. You said that you're not accepting donations of collections. For those of us that are heading towards the inevitable downsizing and are facing the decision of what to do with our collection of jazz records, do you have any alternative suggestions on how we might, I hate to use the phrase, get rid of them, but that's what it comes down to? Yeah, Dick, I get this question a lot. And and actually, let me, let me sort of rephrase it. It's not that we're not accepting collections. It's just that right now, it's not a great time. If you can give us... A, some some time to get our act together and and you get this pandemic out of the way um we can we can we can sort of talk turkey a little bit but but the um the thing that that concerns me with people say collections is you know you want to everybody wants to give us everything because it's just easier and and then that that proposes or that 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 presents a problem for us because see now we have to worry about storing all this stuff that we don't really even not necessarily need just to find the one or two or three gems that we don't have in our collection that's why i keep asking people if you have an inventory and if you don't mind us cherry picking it you know just picking out the things that we need you know that's fine but then, of course, now you're stuck with all that stuff that, <laughs> that, that you know, you, you still want to get rid of, but uh, we don't need it. So what do you do with it? So to answer your question, I used to send people to the, Na the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. Uh, but now they've told us, don't do that anymore because they don't have any room. They don't know what to do with the stuff. And so I don't really know, to be honest with you, um, where else you could go with it. Uh, because, you know, a lot of places just aren't accepting, you know, for instance, 78s. Uh, that's a very, that's a very specialized type of thing. Um, there's a guy in, in Texas named Kurt Nauk who, 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 who does an auction of 78s. Maybe someone like that you could contact. You can go online, see where his situation is. But, you know, he's in Texas, so he would have to drive all the way up here, load up his truck with your stuff and take it back to Texas. And even there, he may not want all your stuff. He may just want things that, that, that are, um, you know, uh, rare or things that he knows he can sell. Uh, for LPs, I still say your best bet is just to go to the Princeton Record Exchange and just, in, in Princeton and just give it to them and, and they'll they won't give you much for it, but they'll give you something and you'll get some money out of it and and they'll take whatever, you know, you have. Uh, Academy Records in New York is another place you could go to for LPs or, or CDs if you want to get rid of those things there. 78s are hard. I, I, it's, I just don't know really where you would go with 78s because uh, just a lot of places that are, are, are taking those. Now, I do know that there are people who would love to go through your 78 collection, and I could, I could maybe give you some of those names, like Matthew Rivera, for instance, who, who does that hot club thing every Monday on, online. Uh, he's a big 78 collector, and there are other people like him, young people like him, who are into 78s now. And they would, they would probably love to go through your 78 collection and, and just take, take stuff. But, but, you know, that's, that's something we'd have to talk about, you know, off, you know when, whenever you're, you're ready to do that. But uh, that's about the best I can, I can offer at this point. I really don't, don't have much else to, to offer with that. Thank you. Okay. A quick, quick follow-up to that. Is it feasible to have an online uh, ability so that owners of these records could go and check and see if what they have is something that you don't and, and just offer those things? 
Well, unfortunately, our 78s were never cataloged online. Hmm. Uh, I have a catalog of our 78s, but it's an in-house thing that somebody did for yeah. us years ago, a gentleman named John Clement, who no longer is with us. Uh, so I have, and, and, and it's not even a complete list, it's only a partial, but it's enough. I mean, he did a lot of work on this thing before he passed. So I do have an, I have a list here, but I can't really share that with anybody. What you'd have to do is just give me a list of what you've got in your collection, and I would just yeah. pick and choose from there. In fact, somebody just recently did that. They just sent me a, coll a, a mm -hmm. list of their 78s, and I'm going through them right now and I'm noticing that we pretty much have everything that's in that collection. You have to, you have to keep in mind, we've been collecting 78s since 19, at least since 1952, okay? <laughs> I mean, Marshall Stearns' original collection was 78s primarily, and we've been adding to it over the years, over the years, over the years. So it's a good bet that whatever you have, unless it's very, very, very rare, uh, we probably have it, really, yeah. and probably even have it in duplicate, because we yeah. do keep duplic duplicates, at least two copies of certain things. Yeah. But uh, but that's that's all we can really do at this point, because we have limited space. I mean, our space when when we we got that space in 1994, we thought, oh my God, look at all this space; it's going to be great. Well, <laughs> 2021, we're pretty much here. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we we're running out of space. Uh, I, in fact, I could, I could almost say we've run out of space. And hopefully, it, you know, we can hope, you know, that the administration can work out some way to give us more space so we can take in more collections. Uh, but mm -hmm. um, that's something that we'll have to work with, with, with the administration mm -hmm. and see what they can do for us. Yeah, thanks. So, Mark Edelman, uh, this was your place in the queue and you dropped to the bottom. Do you want to speak now? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for a great talk, uh, Vinny. Um, uh, I, sorry to bother you with a another technical kind of a question no bother but at all you you have mentioned three times now that people could send you lists so that implies that they're making an inventory now we're not librarians or archivists um have you any kind of suggestion for the casual homebody who has a collection for how to inventory it. I'm, I'm thinking of recordings primarily. Mm -hmm. mm. Boy, that's a good I mean, for example, an app or something that you happen to be acquainted with, something that you think is pretty good. Mm. The only thing that I can think of was, um, was something that a friend of mine created. Um, it's a database that he called Brian. Uh, after Brian Rust, who was a discographer uh, and did a number of discographies over the years. And he said that re the reason he made this thing, this Brian thing, was so that people could inventory their collections. But you have to be a little computer savvy to really work this thing. Um, I can send you the link to it if you can get, if you give me an, you know, a, 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 an email. And, and you can look at it and see if it's something you want to try. But that's that's the only thing I can really think of. Uh, and because he said that's specifically why he made this program to inventory his collection. And so he makes it available to anybody who wants to use it for free. It's for free. And also he gives you tech support. If you something if something goes wrong or something you, you think should be improved, you just tell him, he'll fix it for you. He'll work it out for you. He's a wonderful guy. His name is Steve Albans. And uh, he's retired now, but he but he still has his Brian thing up. So, so you, you give me some information or give it to you know Paul, uh, John, and and you know okay. I'll pass it on and I'll pass the uh, link on to you somehow. And that your last name Edelman is very is very interesting because the answer to jazz studies for a long time was sort of a standalone institution. We weren't part of any any part of the department or anything like that, but. We had a librarian at the at the Rutgers Libraries named Heinrich Edelman. I'm sure he's no relation, <laughs> but he was an amateur trombone player who played both, both classical and jazz trombone. Uh, he's he's Dutch Dutch origin. I actually played in one of his little bands. Uh, they used to play at the the Netherlands Club in New York. They played like Dixieland music. I played banjo and guitar in the van. 
And he became the director of the, uh, the, the Rutgers library system. He heard about the Institute and, and fell in love with us and said, we have to make this part of the library system. And so he gave us all sorts of support, financial and, and whatever that we needed and got us into the library system. And, and I, to this day, I have to say, you know, Edelman saved us. <laughs> Hank Edelman <laughs> saved us. So I know you're, no, you're not related to him, but that, that name just right away, I, when I hear the name Edelman, I just go, yeah, that's the man, man. He, he saved our bacon, man. He was great. <laughs> okay. uh, Thank you. So Mar Marcel Simone. Hi, Vincent. How are you? How you doing, uh, Mr. Mr. Soda Fountain Rag? How you doing there? Uh, yes, indeed. And thank you for that. No problem, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know how hard it was to find that. I mean, I, and 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 trying to record that with that with our ancient equipment, which was, at the time I was having some issues with the equipment, but I, I got it to work. I got it to work, so it worked out. <laughs> so you know, for for background for everybody, um, so this copy of Soda Fountain Rag that that Vincent very kindly gave me two years ago, I was doing some work on you know Duke Ellington's pianism for for a a um, a um, what do you call it a podcast, which actually never happened for a variety of reasons, mm. and um, so I was doing research on that and and could not find a copy. A, a full performance of Soda Fountain Rag, because Ellington, he would late in his life, he would kind of play, he would start playing it, and then he'd stop making a joke that, yeah, and then things ain't what they used to be, I can't play yeah, that anymore, right, I right. can't do this, and so getting a full performance, and, and, and it was just not available anywhere that I could find, so thank you, Vincent, I appreciate it. My, so I was going to ask you about whether you were aware of Brian. Clearly, you are. So you know we can skip that. Mm -hmm. um, but one question: my, the question I had is um, so in terms of um, pushing for making at least some music available to researchers online, is that it would be possible for folks who are not within easy physical distance to newark new jersey mm -hmm. uh to sort of link up with the institute to do some you know research whether it's discographical research or you know research on music musicological you know whatever the reason is that they mm -hmm. want to do they'd be able to do that and even if it wouldn't be uh what you call high fidelity you know at least they could do a first layer of research mm -hmm. and, and then plan a trip to, to the library, to the Institute, so that they could sort of dive in mm -hmm. uh, and actually get at the actual media and so forth and so on. So, so uh, I, I, what do you think about that? You know? Well, you know, this is, this, this is the kind of thing that we're gonna have to talk about at the Institute. Um, you know, the, the pandemic made us aware of the fact that, you know, we're, we're kind of an old fashioned setup at the Institute mm -hmm. of Jazz Studies and that, you know, you have to really come to us Right. Whereas, you know, a lot of places now have a lot of online stuff, a lot of things digitized that you can just go online and, and pull things up. But we're still sort of behind the behind the times on that. Mm -hmm. We're still, you know, and, and so I think if anything, this pandemic has shown us that we need to up our up our uh, our game a little bit here. Uh, actually, a lot, <laughs> because there's a lot of stuff that we have at the Institute that we could probably make available that we're not able to do or haven't been able to do. And we really need to start doing doing some more of that. Because mm. right now, even now, you know, you you can't get access to any of our music. I, I have to basically make a recording of it and right. and send it to you that way. And and even then you have to sign off a, a form saying that you're only going to use it for research purposes. And right. if you do anything else with it and, they t and you get hauled into court, you know, we're not going to get, you know, taken to the court. Right. Uh, that's always a big concern at Rutgers that we don't end up in court in some court case being sued because mm -hmm. we gave somebody some music or a photograph or something that yeah. that we don't have the rights to. And that's the other issue with us, too, is the fact that we don't have the rights to a lot of the stuff that we have at the Institute. We're just sort of we just sort of have it we're, 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 we hold it and we make it available. But but we can't give you permission to use it in a book or use it on a podcast or anything like that. Right, but we're right. trying to we're trying to work around that even we have some forms that you can sign that will, you know, give us, you know, <laughs> 
freedom to do that and not get sued if something happens with the materials other than what you claim you're going to do with it. So this, these are things that we're going to have to talk about. And, and so right now, I can't say we have anything like that, but I'm not saying it's not going to happen in the future. It, it's quite possible that we will be able to do this and make things available to, for researchers off, off site. Uh, one really. point also is that increasingly musicians themselves, um, I mean, I, I know several musicians who routinely record all of their gigs. Mm -hmm. And so they have these personal archives of, of right. almost everything that they've played. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Um, the, the sound quality might not be great because sometimes it's just a cassette. Thing. I, there's a bass player, Roberto Miranda. Mm -hmm. uh, he brings a cassette well, used to bring a cassette to his gigs and mm -hmm. literally when he's about to take a solo you see him just before the piece starts awesome. he'll start up a new cassette put it under his seat and then just record that way uh, mm -hmm. i'm sure that's not what a high quality uh, recording but it's probably a way for him to listen to his own planning uh own playing sorry mm -hmm. and kind of you know self-criticize himself also there is like um, um uh, smalls that that club in the in the, in the village mm -hmm. They kind of uh, they they video every single one of the sets in mm -hmm. their club, and they wow. have some giant archive of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, not all of it is things that could be released that a, a record company would want to release. Right. But obviously, it's it's a precious record of what was played in that club sure. over the years. Mm -hmm. And for an institution like the IJS, you know, you'd want to. To have that, and again, mm -hmm. I would urge you to sort of talk to them. Oh, sure. Whether after some amount of time they want to pass some of that on to you. Mm -hmm. but of course, hey, hey Marcel. Marcel. Storage, yada, yada, yada. So, Marcel, sorry to interrupt you, but we're almost out of time, and we have a few more hands raised. I'm done. I, and I, hey, I, Marcel, I, how, I know you're a friend of Tim Glenn. Question, which is, are you looking for volunteers? Yeah. Okay. Well, at, first at of this all, point, at this point, no. We right. can't, so can't, can't do two, it. two quick suggestions that popped up in the chat. We won't go into them much, but one was hire some students to modern, modernize the archive. Students know a lot of the tech stuff, I guess that's for sure. And the other is, why don't you start a radio mm -hmm. station? Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's talking about you, the institute, or you, the person, but I would say either one. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess We've you been, know we, we, you've. You've been there before. Right? We, we've talked about doing podcasts, and we yeah. and we and and again, we might actually start doing some of that uh, because we were on WBGO for a while, yeah. but they 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 killed us at some point. Uh, but um, we could we could do our own podcast. Yeah. Rutgers, Rutgers University has a radio station. Publishing uh, is easy these days. Yeah, you just yeah. Type this, everything. So we, we so can look, do that. So look, uh, we uh, let me Bapi Sen. If you have a quick question, go ahead. Uh, uh, Jazz is an effect of very many world music, and one of the world music is Indian classical music. And one of the stalwart of his is Ravi Shankar. He, is there any effect on jazz music, Indian music on jazz? Yes, uh, I, for, I, I don't have the name of the book, but I just saw a book, in fact, about the in, about jazz's influence on Indian music. Uh, I, I remember the gentleman coming to the Institute and, and asking uh, for some help on some research in that topic. And I, I did help him and he, and the book did come out, but I don't remember the name of the book, I'm sorry. Uh, but but um, I know for a fact that, that some jazz musicians very early in 1920s, and wound up in India, uh, and 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 some of that influence probably you know started that far back. Uh, jazz is you know j jazz went all over the world. I mean it's you know almost every country is, it seems to have had some version of that uh, at some point. Uh, once uh, musicians from this country started traveling uh, to to places like the Far East and uh, and you know Japan and so on and so forth, so. Yeah, there's an if there's influence. Sure, sure. No doubt about it. Okay, at, at this point, it's, um, it's actually 1131. I guess we can go a little bit longer. We have a couple more hands raised. Is that okay with you, Vinny? Yeah. Just stick around oh, yeah, for a little fine, longer? No. I'm okay, working fine. from home, so I got a place to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we all are too. So anyway, uh, uh, Tom Pate, you're next on the list. Yes, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. 
Ah, okay. Sounds a little funny on my end. Uh, I uh, uh, will say I appreciate the presentation and all the information, and I know uh, what you're doing uh, to preserve the uh, record of uh, jazz in the past. But uh, I wondered uh, if you have any association to the uh, jazz studies program at William Patterson University. Um, the association we have with them is that uh, a gentleman named David Dempsey and another professor there, Carol Frierson, uh, they both bring their classes to the Institute of Jazz Studies to do extensive research on, on whatever projects that they're doing at the time. And um, so every year we get the visit from, from both of them. Um, of course, not now with the pandemic, unfortunately, but um, that's that's the the association. I mean, they they know we that we're at the institute. They know that we're the the largest you know archive of, of its type. And even though they have a, an archive of their own, I believe uh, it's not anywhere near as extensive as ours. Uh, so that's why they bring their classes to to us. But uh, yeah, we're, we're we're very much aware of the William Patterson situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Thank thank you, mm -hmm. Ron Ho Ron Hoke. Wait, let me send you an unmute request. Go ahead. Ron, unmute. Ron, there you go. Okay, I think I finally made it. Uh, thanks very much, Vince. That, that was a very interesting talk. Uh, my, my question relates to the fact that New Jersey and Newark in particular have a very really rich history in, uh, in jazz. Yes. Is there any uh, part of your uh, collection that specifically highlights New Jersey and, and Newark's contribution? Uh, one of the reasons I'm ask, asking this is uh, young people who may be interested in, in jazz, in particular, uh, Newark and New Jersey's history in jazz might find it interesting if they could go to a specific place and, and find out the information along these lines. Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, uh, you know, it's it's interesting you should say that. Um, you know, um, a lot of the collections or jazz jazz collections that are that are, re are recent or new, uh, a lot of them are, are um, regional collections. Uh, highlighting the music of that particular area uh and well except for the one in new orleans that's an old collection uh but um they do specifically you know focus on new orleans jazz and new orleans music um rutgers institute of jazz studies that was never really a regional collection because because think about it marshall stearns he founded this thing in 1952 in his apartment in greenwich village he wasn't necessarily interested in just jazz in New York. He was interested in the whole shebang. So, so it was never a regional collection. It was always about the entire scope of the music. And so when it came to Newark, that's when we sort of started thinking along those very same lines that you're just mentioning that, okay, we're in Newark. Newark's a rich jazz or was a rich jazz town. Maybe we should start thinking more in terms of having some Newark specific you know things and we do have that we do have some stuff there at the institute that is newark specific and, and new jersey specific but it's mixed in with everything else so you you sort of have to just come in and you know i can steer you to where that material is but there's no like you don't you just can't walk in and say here's the new jersey you know collection or here's the newark collection it doesn't work that way it's all part of the collection it's all in it's all integrated into in the collection but definitely we are definitely i mean look we got the count basie collection red bank new jersey i mean please that's that's one of the reasons why we wanted the collection because of the red bank connection um we have great and monker's collection or some of his collection he's a newark native we have we're, we're we're hoped someday and this is fingers crossed to get the wayne shorter collection and uh you know because he's a newark you know person and uh and we have of course recordings from the savoy record label we have all the savoy stuff and that savoy was records was a newark newark new jersey label we have the only recordings of the uh savoy dictators which was a uh, very uh uh uh, kind of unknown group of teenagers basically who recorded for Savoy 
uh, and and their first recordings were done for Savoy. In fact, the only recordings were done for Savoy, and we have those recordings. And so, you know, we 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 do try to focus on the neural connect, uh, connection at the Institute of Jazz Studies. But yes, that that's something that we we definitely are uh, very cognizant of, and we're going to keep keep doing more of that because uh, you know. Newark, Newark was a jazz town. I mean, it, it was it was hopping at one time. It was all all sorts of things going on, and uh, there's a wonderful uh, series of books by uh, uh, a, a former journalist named Barbara Kukla, who's done a bunch of books on on jazz in Newark. If you find those any one of those books, just you know pick it up, check it out, and you'll see how rich a jazz history you know Newark really had at one time. So, thank you. Sure. I guess Mike Katz is up. Hi, Vincent. Hey, man. Thank you very much for a most informative and entertaining presentation. My pleasure. As you uh, probably know, I'm a former president and member of the New Jersey Jazz Society. <laughs> and, I was a member at one time, too, a long time ago. Oh, you got to renew your membership. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the board. I was on the board. I was on the board with, uh, uh, oh, God. Uh, Terry Ter Terrence Ripmaster and yes, people right. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. A little before my time, but I do remember Terry. Uh, okay. Uh, just wanted to make a statement for those who might be interested in uh, donating or disposing of records, CD collections, whatever. The New Jersey Jazz Society does accept uh, donations. Great. And uh, <clears throat> we usually uh, then resell them at uh, record shows and. I'm also online and proceed to use to uh, support the work of the society. If anybody's interested in that, uh, you can contact us through our website at uh, www.njjs.org. Uh, Vincent, just a question. You mentioned, uh, of course, Phil Shapp's past, recent passing, another jazz luminary who died last week, I think, was George Ween. Did you uh, ever have any contact yeah. with George or have any? stories you'd like to tell about him you know it's interesting i I'm, I'm supposed to write something and put it on facebook about george ween's passing so i'm gonna i'm gonna work on that but um i i had i never really got to know him uh dan morgenstern was good friends with george ween knew george ween for many many years and uh in fact he sent me some some stuff about george that a lot of people didn't know about him. Uh, one of the things being that that he was a big wine connoisseur. I had no idea that he was a wine connoisseur of all things. But but Dan knew all this little inside information about George Ween, and uh, and I'm glad he sent that stuff to me. And uh, I'll try to work that into my little you know blurb when I do it for 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 the Facebook page. But um, no, I'm afraid I never really got to know him. I'm I'm sure I met him once or twice when he came to the institute for a visit or whatever. But there was no I, the closeness was not like with Phil Schaap. I mean Phil. Phil and I would hang out and listen to records and and talk about stuff and, and you know Phil was just insane. He he liked the fact that I could whistle jazz solos, so he would ask me to whistle Big Spider Beck solos and and, and, and sorts of you know weird things like that. And we, oh, we I wish we fun time. I wish we knew that sooner. We don't have time. <laughs> You'll have to come back. Okay, all right. <laughs> Book me. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so this is this is wonderful. So so Paul Paul Groom. Yes, sir. Um, Vinny, that was yes. fantastic. Uh, let Thank me you. do a couple of different things. Um, first of all, my apologies in the um, in the bio I gave. I never mentioned because I didn't know that you're an expert in blowing bubbles with gum. So. Um, <laughs> That's something that we will make a note of. Okay, um, thank you. Let, let me also say that the association that uh, Vinny was uh, president of, which was the Association for Recorded Sound Collections Journal, has a website which is full of good stuff, good yes. recorded stuff. Yes. And on Saturday night, I enjoyed myself enormously listening to uh, Vinny Pelot talk about Benny Goodman's 1938 Carnegie Hall <laughs> swing concert. Oh my God, that's um, <laughs> Which he said was the first time King swing was played at Carnegie Hall. 
in any event, the uh, Summit Old Guard has two ways of uh, showing their appreciation to you, neither of which are adequate, but the first one is to provide you with a certificate, uh, and that is the certificate. And the second one is to uh, give you a round of applause. So, gentlemen, whenever you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh my thank god you. <laughs> thank you thank you you guys are great <laughs> thank you Vinny. we appreciate it um, enormously you were so very good talker well but, hey listen i enjoyed you know doing this you guys you guys are fantastic really <laughs> thank well, you for thank having you. me thank you